There are two major economies that are directly opposite each other, India and Indonesia. A fascinating story unfolds about two countries locked in a fierce battle to become a global economic player. India chalked up 8.7% growth in the year. Indonesia has set a growth target of 5.3% next year. Here's a story the world never saw coming. These two Asian giants, boasting a colossal combined population of 1.7 billion people, are primed to outshine their peers in the top 20 economies for not just 2023, but also in the near future as predicted by the IMF. What makes their journey truly fascinating is how they're charting a course for growth in a world marked by declining global collaboration, complicated international relationships, the rise of automation, and evolving energy landscapes. But here's the twist. They're not exactly achieving economic prosperity. They're also carefully navigating the complexities of running a governance, striking a careful balance that ensures their success in elections, and keep peace in society. Their story is not just a regional phenomenon, it has far-reaching implications. It's as though they're unraveling a universal secret, offering a roadmap for countries worldwide and providing a roadmap for countries around the world looking for success in the 2020s and beyond. At first, India and Indonesia share striking similarities. Both are under the leadership of charismatic leaders who secured their first election victories in 2014. As we look ahead, both nations are gearing up for upcoming elections. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Indonesia's President Joko Widodo have their roots in local politics and a track record for achieving results. They govern vast and relatively youthful nations, with India boasting a population of 1.4 billion and Indonesia with 280 million people. Both countries have witnessed remarkable economic growth over the past decade. India's GDP has surged by an impressive 71%, while Indonesia's has grown by a noteworthy 52%. What's interesting is that services such as IT and software services, rather than manufacturing, are the primary drivers of their economies. Trade plays a big role and represents about 40% of their GDP, with foreign direct investment pouring in at approximately 1.5% of GDP. What's more is that a large part of the workforce operates within informal sectors. These countries are currently in the midst of substantial infrastructure development projects. Since Chukauki took office, Indonesia has completed 18 ports, 21 airports, and constructed 1,700 kilometers of toll roads. Meanwhile, India is adding a jaw-dropping 10,000 kilometers of new highways each year. However, Despite their impressive achievements, there is still plenty of room for further economic progress. Indonesia's gross national income per person stands at $4,180, with India's figure approximately half of that amount. Both nations fall into the category of lower middle income economies, underscoring the significant potential for future development. But here is where the paths diverge. To shed lights on these differences, let's explore four key aspects of each country. Their leading export sectors, industrial policies, and geopolitical stances. India's power shines brightly in the field of technology services. With the capacity to produce half a million new engineers annually, India captured a remarkable 15% of global IT services spending in 2021. In contrast, Indonesia's strength lies in commodities, including high-demand resources like nickel, driven by the global shift towards clean energy. By 2030, Indonesia is poised to become the world's fourth largest producer of these green commodities, vital for batteries and energy grids. These industries generate large foreign income. In 2021, tech services accounted for about 17% of India's total exports by value, while commodities made up 22% of Indonesia's exports. Yet, it's worth noting that these sectors, while financially rewarding, create relatively few jobs. Even India's IT industry, a global powerhouse, employs just 5 million workers. The landscape is fascinating, isn't it? Now. Let's dive deeper into their strategies for turbocharging the private sector through industrial policies. India holds a favorable position in this regard. 
The MSCI India Index, covering approximately 85% of the market, boasts a substantial value of around $830 billion, equivalent to about 24% of India's GDP. In contrast, the Indonesia Index is valued at a more modest $123 billion, which represents approximately 10% of their GDP. What's particularly interesting is India's impressive 108 unicorn businesses, a number second only to the United States and China. Prime Minister Modi is placing a $30 billion bet on production-linked incentives to stimulate investment in 14 priority sectors, including semiconductors. His commitment to achieving net-zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2070 involves the development of solar farms, battery production, and much more. Beyond environmental benefits, the primary aim is to generate jobs and reduce power costs. India's energy import expenses are projected to drop from 4% of GDP in 2021 to 2.5% 2 in 2032. On the other hand, Indonesia's flagship industrial policy known as downstreaming revolves around natural resources and it employs a different approach. The focus here is more on using sticks than carrots. The government aims to encourage multinationals to establish local refineries by banning the export of selected raw materials. For instance, exports of raw nickel were prohibited in 2014, which led to an increase in nickel smelters growing from just two before the ban to as many as 30 by the end of this year. Additionally, Indonesia is charting a course towards higher value activities aiming to produce electric car batteries with a combined capacity of 140 GWh by 2030, nearly matching the global production in 2020. Notably, last year, Hyundai, an automobile manufacturer, commenced the construction of electric cars in Indonesia. The contrast in their approaches raises fascinating questions. India's bet on high-tech green industries offers the promise of economic growth and environmental sustainability. Meanwhile, Indonesia's reliance on resource-based policies tends to move up the value chain and seize the opportunities in emerging sectors like electric vehicle manufacturing. The intrigue deepens when we consider the geopolitical positions of these nations. How do their global alliances and rivalries impact their growth ambitions? As Sino-American tensions rise, India and Indonesia maintain distinct political positions which will shape foreign investment and trade in the coming years. Indonesia, in line with its non-alignment policy, aims to strike a balance between China and the West. Its sovereign wealth fund, launched in 2021, anticipates up to $3 billion in investments from China, one of its significant sources of foreign direct investment. The Indonesian government sees this as a protection of its own interests and states that, Indonesia puts Indonesia first, as stated by Minister Nadia Makarim. In contrast, India, under Modi's leadership, approaches China with greater caution. Faced with border disputes, India has aligned itself with the Quad, a strategic coalition involving the United States, Australia, and Japan. This geopolitical stance carries economic implications. In 2020, India banned Chinese apps, including TikTok, and initiated investigations into Chinese tech firms such as Vivo and Xiaomi. Part of Mr. Modi's industrial strategy aims to attract Western companies seeking to diversify away from China. For instance, a unit of Foxconn, a Taiwanese iPhone manufacturer, received approval to establish a billion-dollar facility in the state of Karnataka. So, which approach will make these countries rich faster? India and Indonesia share some common challenges like favoritism. Jakawi is closely linked to well-connected business tycoons, and in India, the troubles of influential conglomerates like the Adani Group make national headlines. Arvind Subramaniam, a former economic advisor to the Indian government, points out that Japan's Zaibatsu conglomerates and South Korea's Chebol competed globally in trade sectors. But Adani and similar Indian favorites mainly catered to the domestic market, offering them some protection. A similar situation may apply to Indonesian firms. In the long run, India, with its more developed private sector and capital markets, is likely to maintain faster growth. However, there's a political risk. Both countries rely on a model where a specific sector of the economy surges ahead, with wealth either spreading through informal channels or via welfare programs. In this process, the political system handles the social pressures that emerge. In Indonesia, the government shapes and satisfies public opinion, while in India, it sometimes stirs and directs public anger. While this may not have apparent short-term consequences, it could become a significant issue in the long run. 
As we conclude our exploration of India and Indonesia's journey towards growth leadership, the road ahead holds many opportunities and challenges for both nations. The future will reveal the ultimate winner, and we're eagerly watching how this exciting competition unravels.